I learned very early on that one of the more passionate genres of music was R&B. R&B is basically melodic passion. 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 I realized that it was going to be music for me at nine years old. I grew up in a house with my mother, my sister, my grandmother, and five aunts, and me. But my mom, you know, blue collar mom, just making sure that the kids was all right. She worked every casino, pretty much every position in the casino that you could work. Every night she would bring home a different kind of music for uh, me and her to sit around and listen to. You know, initially it was uh, a lot of R&B, a lot of Motown and stuff like that, but then she started bringing home like Wayne Newton and the Rat Pack, Tom Jones and, and stuff like that. And that kind of fueled my love for melody as opposed to just music. Just music. Just music. I'm living in this house with all of these women and I'm writing in a journal because uh, initially I was kind of an angry little kid. Dad wasn't around, uncles come and go real quick. As I'm growing up, becoming a young man, I don't really have anybody to bounce these emotions off of. I needed an outlet and uh, initially I started doing really, really stupid stuff, breaking windows and just, just, just something to, to get it off me, whatever it was. My mom gave me the notebook, the red notebook, and uh, she said, write it down. And I said, write what down? And she said, I don't care, just write it down. Whatever it is you're feeling, whatever it is going on in there, write it down there. The breaking point, I don't remember what I was upset about, but I was really, really mad at something. And I ran in my room and I slammed the door and I grabbed my notebook. And initially I was writing words, but then after a while it just kind of became just trying to get that off of me. And what I realized after I was done is that I didn't feel those emotions anymore. Whatever it is that was bothering me, it wasn't bothering me anymore because it wasn't inside anymore, it was on the page. Now. From journal entries to poetry to songs, that was kind of the transition for me. In an R&B song, it was okay for a man to cry. In an R&B song, it was okay for a man to show weakness. Like it was all right to be vulnerable in R&B if you did it right and if you did it from the heart. My five kings are Prince, Stevie, Marvin, Michael, Sammy Davis Jr. These five men are the five that, you know, if you can meld them into one person, that's what I've been trying to accomplish my whole career. It was actually a friend of mine in school that told me that music is something that you could actually do as a career. Like you could grow up and be a guy that just does music and people give you money for it. And I was like, what? Oh, okay, well I found my career. That's, that's what I'm doing. Yeah, sign me up now. I'm, I'm in, I'm in. And I, I never looked back. Mario's Let Me Love You was my first number one. It's the first number one song that I had ever written. Which was weird for me because I had like the number one song on the radio but nobody knew who the hell I was. Like I could walk up down the street and not be bothered by anybody. Which honestly was kind of cool. You see cars rolling by and they, and they blaring it loud and I'm like, I wrote that. Yeah, that, that's me. Baby, I just don't get it. Do you enjoy being hurt? I know you smell the perfume, the makeup on the shirt. You don't believe his stories You know that there are lies Bad as you are You stick around And I just don't know why I dug that part of being a songwriter The freedom to still be a regular person While at the same time Music is still your profession After that song came out And did what it did for a long time I didn't have a name I was Oh yeah, you the kid that wrote the Mario song That was my name That's, that's what everybody was Oh yeah, yeah, yeah The kid that wrote the Mario song Hey, hey, go call the, the kid that wrote the Mario song and I answered to it proudly, like, yep, yep, that's me, I did that, that was me. That song got me the attention of a lot of different people. Uh, L.A. Reid and Jay-Z, for example, which would eventually become uh, the record deal that would introduce Neil to the world. When we first started putting together my first album, at this point I have the Mario record, and everybody knows that I can write it here for other people, so now the question became, can he do it for himself? So there was a little bit of pressure, but I say a little bit because I wasn't really letting it bother me. I was just so happy to be in the position that I was in. It's like, yo, I am really sitting in a room right now, surrounded by people that are dedicated to helping me produce my first album. This is a dream come true. This is what I've wanted since I was nine years old. Like I'm here and I was, I was very much aware of what it was in the moment. We wasn't concerning ourselves with genre. We wasn't concerning ourselves with where we was gonna land. We was just jumping, just because we was just enjoying what we was doing. I genuinely feel like when you listen to that album, you can kind of hear the joy that everybody was feeling as we was putting these records together. Like it just, it just felt 
everything just felt right. I don't know if you've ever been in that place in life where, and it doesn't have to be major, but where for whatever reason, everything just kind of fell in line on that day. Like I had a like full four months of that. When I first met Stargate, if you know, you know, two tall, lanky white dudes from Norway. And I must admit, I definitely walked in the room and judged the book by its cover. I was like, there's no R&B happening here. The very first track they ever played me was the music that we now know as So Sick. I let them get about 15 seconds through and I was like, wait, 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 wait. Run it back. Played it again. Ding, 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 ding. Somebody got a pen? So Sick is about the first time that I ever truly, truly fell in love. At that point in my life when this story took place, I maybe might have been 15, maybe 16, somewhere in there. I had said I love you before. Well, I'm not proud of it. We all grow from somewhere. But at one point, if that meant me getting what I want, I would say it. Just kind of was what it was. I know I'm not alone. Anyway. Crying uh, <laughs> over you, and I'm so sick of love With this particular girl in this particular time, it was real, I actually meant it. I really did love her. But the problem was, when it's a group of friends, one guy in the group gets a girlfriend, so now he's spending all the time with the girlfriend and not hanging out with the, with the crew anymore. Yeah, I was that guy. My friends would call like, hey, uh, your girl gonna let you out the house tonight? You know, like stupid stuff like that. And, and, and me being just young and young-minded, I let it get to me. I let that start bothering me to the point where I started treating her poorly. And your memory she wasn't with that, she left, and I didn't realize the stupid thing that I had done until she was gone, which is kind of the way of all things, like you don't realize what you had until it's gone. I kid you not, at the time, no matter where I was at, no matter what station we put on on the radio, there was always a sad ass slow song playing that would just take me back to the fact that you just lost somebody that you genuinely and truly cared about behind pride and ego. A song poured out of me in probably about three minutes. It might be the fastest song I've ever written. Sexy Love, kind of to a degree written about the same girl. She kind of had a hold on me, she did. I, I will admit, she kind of had a hold on me. I just remember that whenever she would breathe right here, that I would get like these chills, these goosebumps, and like it would make the hairs on the back of my neck stand up listen to the track that they're playing and I just keep getting thrown back into these memories of that relationship and and you know the, the good stuff when it was good and the the, the line just came to me came she makes the hairs on the back of my neck stand up just once a... the day the album came out <laughs> I remember uh, waking up and throwing up like right away, like uh, <laughs> when the first numbers came in, and they told me I did like 370 first week, 370,000 copies first week. Uh, okay, okay, they like it. We good. From my first album debuting at number one, moving on up the line in time to winning my first Grammy, meeting the president, performing at the White House multiple times. It took a good 10 years for me to like sit still long enough to realize what we had actually done. Once the ball started rolling, we didn't stop. We was on the roll for like two years straight at one point. Like we just didn't stop. We didn't even really have the time to sit and celebrate and, and kind of bask in it in the moment because things just, just kept moving and we liked it that way. There is power 
in music. There is world changing, life changing, life saving power in music. And when you realize that, you kind of can't look at it the way you did anymore. You can't unknow it. You have to kind of lock into that responsibility now. I've done everything in my power to maintain my normalcy because I've seen what happens when you allow yourself to buy all the way in to the smoke and mirrors and the glitz and glamour and, and the fantasy that is the music industry. Get. And I told myself this at a very, very young age, very early in my career, no matter how big I get, I will always be a regular damn person. I have to lock into the truth, which is I am no better than anybody else. If you can keep that right here, as all of the fantasy and glitz and glamour is happening around you, you might be all right. If you ever lose sight of that, we've seen what can happen. Can't have that happen to me, especially now I got kids. I got, I got people that's dependent on me. I've circled the globe three, four times at this point. I've been a little bit everywhere, I've done a little bit of everything. And I can honestly say the most fulfilling thing that I've ever done is be a father. It is the greatest thing I've ever done. Being a parent will teach you patience. It'll teach you humility. It'll teach you the importance of time. If you haven't latched onto that yet, how valuable time is. Spend 10 minutes with your kid just doing something silly. As long as he's laughing and having a good time, you've done your part as a parent. Like, don't, don't beat yourself up because you don't get to spend all day with your kids. Who spends all day with their kids? Well, maybe now, because this whole pandemic thing. I don't care about fame. None of that stuff means anything to me anymore. I want you to go get it because I need to feed my kids. That's why I want you to go get it now. That is, that's, that's the most important thing now. That is the focal point of life. Of life. <laughs> what it is to be a black man in America is to be in a foot race with a bunch of other people and for whatever reason you have on a backpack full of bricks, shackles on both feet, handcuffs, and a person with a gun on your heels. And you gotta run this race, same as everybody else, with all of these things attached to you, with all of these things making it that much harder for you to get anywhere. You have to be that much better, that much smarter, that much faster, whatever the case may be, in order to get ahead in this life. You have to be excellent, pretty much at all times. Your excellence has to hide the fact that you're black to some of these people. Okay, he's black, but he's really smart. Okay, yeah, he's black, but damn, he can shoot that basketball. Yeah, he's black, but ooh, did you hear that song? Black men are definitely a target. It's an accomplishment for a black man to get old enough for somebody to call him old. Somebody called me old the other day and I said, thank you. Damn right, 41. If 41 is old, then I'll be old all day long because I know cats younger than me that ain't here no more. We say black lives matter. We didn't say white lives don't matter. We didn't say black lives matter more. We just said black lives matter. That just means we matter too. George Floyd was not the first black man to be killed by police on camera. What made this so special is that the world slowed down and everybody had no choice but to look and see what is happening here. And you couldn't unsee that. You couldn't ignore that. How do I see I got the privilege to sing for the family at George Floyd's funeral. They asked me to sing. They didn't tell me what to sing. They said, just choose something that you feel like is appropriate for the moment. So I got up there and I sang, It's So Hard to Say Goodbye, yesterday. I thought we get to see forever, but forever gone now. As I was walking off stage, his brother, stopped me and said, bro, I don't know if you knew, that was one of George's favorite records. That was one of his favorite songs, period. And I'll take with me the memory to be my sunshine the It's a hard The only way for you to fail is to just not do anything. All the tools are right there in your face. You just gotta dedicate the time to it and be patient enough to let it happen the way it's gonna happen. 
I have been working on a brand new album that will be out this year. The concept of this album is basically just an escape from the screwy and crummy reality that it is right now. I feel like we didn't need another record reminding us that things are fucked up right now. I don't, I don't need to remind you of that in a colorful song. I don't, need, I don't need to do that for you. You can turn on the TV and see that. You can look out your window and see that. What you do need is a moment to inhale and exhale. This album is an hour and 40 minutes roughly of breathe. Get away from the stresses and dramas of your life for just this long. Let it re-energize you so that you can walk back out into that storm and do what it is you gotta do. That's what this album is. Music is a part of who I am, literally. Physically, it's a part of who I am. So I will always do music, that will always be. And uh, any other mediums that I can lend myself to and do right by, you'll see me there too. So I'm gonna say what I always say, keep your eyes to the sky, your ears to the ground. You will hear me, see me, I will be around, always. Your seduction.